This is by far the most complicated topic in future interests. The good news, again, is I'm not testing you on it. Um, and let me explain to you why. Um, the rule against perpetuities converts every single question of property law into a very complicated game of what if. It takes the most simple questions you can think of and makes them insanely bad. Um, it makes it impossible for me to grade, okay? Because someone can always come up with some convoluted hypothetical of why a future interest may be voided. It screws up everything. So I'm going to teach it to you. I'm going to teach it to you, but I'm not going to test you on it. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to know it. It will be on the bar. And just as a preview, the way the bar tests you on stuff is very simple. It'll be a very easy, straightforward question, not sort of things I put on exam. My exam questions are not that simple. You're welcome. Um, in other words, if you could do my exam, the bar will be a piece of cake for property. Um, but I need to teach it to you. Okay, so that's what we're covering for today. So let's explain where we are. By the way, I've been in touch with um, iReef, and I've been complaining. What I need from you is this. If you're here and you're not able to sign in, I need you to take a screenshot of what you see. You want to do a screenshot on your phones or, or your desktop? I've been playing games with these people now for like two weeks, and they keep saying, oh, check if it's wireless or 4G. Check your browser app. It happens to everyone, and you all have different devices, and you're all in different connections. So it, it's not the school's network. I, I, I don't think that's the answer. Um, so if you do have a problem with this, uh, I need you to right away do a screenshot. And if it's not letting you log in, if the app is crashing, in other words, when it doesn't work, you need to tell me why it doesn't work. I can forward that to iReef. I tell them it's not working, it doesn't tell me anything. Um, I put a little fear of God in them. I told them if this isn't working, I'll change to a different app next semester. And they, then they reply to you really quickly. That, <laughs> that, because that's like, what, $15 times 80. So th that they listen to. OK, any questions? All right, let's review a little bit. And I'll, actually, this is, I'll give you for your question today. It's not a poll. I don't know how to do this as a poll question. But this is your, one of your questions for your midterm from yesterday or two days ago. Um, so let's, let's walk through this one, and this will give you a, uh, this is question number two, I think. I'll send you a copy of the exam once everything's graded. I'll send you also uh, the A-plus answer, as well as my explanation of what I was looking for. But we'll just do this one straightforward enough to get yourselves um, eased into future interests again. Okay? Uh, who's next? Who's up? Oh, someone has to be up. Shana, Gabe, are you next? <laughs> All right, Gabe, so here we have this conveyance, right? It says Potter transfers Blackacre to Ron for his life. Then one year after Hermione provides Ron with a proper funeral to Hermione and her heirs. This was your exam question. So Gabe, let's walk through this one step at a time, right? Why is this question so tricky, right? What about this makes it a little bit different than you've seen before? Well, why is this a little bit weird? Um, because it kind of, when I was reading it, it kind of seemed like it wasn't necessarily contingent on her throwing a, a proper funeral for her to be like his interest. Okay. And there's like a, a gap. Ah, the okay, that's what I'm looking for, the gap. This is what makes this question so difficult, right? Not difficult, but, but, but different. Potter gives it to Ron for life. Then one year after Hermione provides Ron at the funeral. That means for at least one year. For at least one year. Who has it, Gabe? Okay. For at least one year, Potter holds on to it. Now, it might be more than a year, right? What if the funeral, you know, is this lavish funeral, it takes six months to plan, right? Then it's a year and six months. 
right? We don't know how long Hermione has to give Ron a funeral. In fact, Gabe, what's the longest period of time there can be where Hermione can still give the funeral? Uh, a year? No. How long do we have to wait around and see if Hermione gives the funeral? Oh, it doesn't say. It doesn't say. So what's the longest possible duration of time in which Hermione can still give this funeral? Can Hermione live forever? No, well, it's the end of her life. That's the answer, right? You, with this question, you have to wait and see. You give a funeral at any time. It doesn't say when. So you have to wait till Hermione dies until see if she then gives the proper funeral. And then Gabe, just one more question for you. If Hermione does give the funeral at some point during her natural life, what happens to Blackacre? But who'd you take it away from? Uh, Potter. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna just get the logistics, right? Even before you get to the language, the the, the, the conceptual question takes a minute or two to walk through. So, um, uh, Daniel, let's walk through them, the, the interest, right? So, easy enough, Ron has a life estate, right? And present interest, so that uh, I'll, I'll give to you. Present interest and life estate, right? And by the way, on the exam, I think I said identify and discuss if you just give me this, you're not doing discuss, right? You have to explain why, right? If you looked at all the exams, you'd know that, okay? So Daniel, what's Potter's interest here? I'm asking when the conveyance was drafted. Oh, that's right. Why is this a reversion? Because it goes right back to it. Yeah. When you have a life estate and it goes back to the grantor after the end of the life, it's called reversion, right? So, so Potter has a future interest in reversion. Okay. But Michelle, does Potter have a future interest in reversion in fee simple? Um, no. No. What is his uh, uh, reversion subject to? Well, <laughs> so if Hermione gives a proper funeral, what happens to Potter's interest? What happens to Potter's reversion if Hermione gives the funeral? And what do we call a future interest that cuts short someone else's interest? So I'll finish up, Michelle. What do we call Hermione's interest here? You already said it. Okay, well that's, that, that's that, we're, we're started, we're not done yet. Julian's already yelling at me, right? She has a future interest in executory interest, right? That's an okay answer, right? But we're not done yet. All right, so Hadia, how would we make this answer better, right? What could we do to make both Potter and Hermione's interest a little bit more precise? How can we make this a little more precise? Very good, right? So we said that, that Potter has a futurist reversion subject to Hermione's executory interest. Okay. That's exactly correct. The reversion itself is subject to being executed, being cut short. Okay, everyone understand? Everyone understand what I'm saying, right? It's not to say that Potter has reversion. You also have to say it's subject to the executory interest. Because it's possible that Potter keeps it for the rest of his life. Hermione might just die and never give a funeral, in which case it's, it's Potter's for good, right? It's Potter's for good, and it's heirs as well. But if Hermione does give the funeral, then it cuts short. Now, Arlette, let's get a little bit even more strong, right? How could we describe Hermione's executory interest a little more precisely? How, what, what, how would we describe it? It would be, um, it would be a string. Which one is it? You said both. You oh, sorry. Oh, 
spring because it's like comes out from the ground. Floor. Yes, exactly right. It's a springing executory interest. And our let's say correctly, why is it springing and not shifting? Because it's cutting short the future interest of the grantor. That is O, or that is, that is, that is, that is, that is Potter, right? Potter is the grantor. It's cutting short. So you say it's a future interest in springing executory interest. And be precise, our life finish it up. How would we finish that sentence? In? If Hermione gives this a funeral, what in, what what does state does she have for Blackacre? Uh, <laughs> future interest then. Sorry, can you repeat the question? If Hermione gives a funeral, what is what does state does she get? Oh, future. Perfect. Yeah. So it's a future interest. Spring executory interest. Be simple. There's a lot of pieces of information there, and you can see the difference between like a a B answer, right, and a B plus answer and an A answer, and an A plus answer. And along the way, you have to explain why. It's not just writing this, but I'm, I'm telling you my, my you know, explanation. But if you just write, yeah, reversion and executory interest, OK, that's fine. That'll get you to a B, right? If you want an A, you got to do this. Right? Just giving you the right answer is good. It'll get you a B. You, know, you, you do what you're supposed to. Right? But you need to drill down and do the um, do the dirty work, okay? And, and this sort of question I gave you, I mean, this is this is par for the course we'll give you on the exam. Um, it's a complicated question. It took us, what, we're now two, so maybe about 10 minutes to walk through? Okay, on the exam, you have about 15 minutes per question. This is about how long it should take you. Right? This, is, this, is, this is a reasonable amount of time given how much time you have to read the question. 15 minutes to write the answer, you guys are in the, in the ball game, okay? Any questions on it? I don't want to do the entire exam, I don't have time, I gotta do, it's rule against perpetuity stuff. We'll take the full class, but I want to give you that little snippet. Any questions on this? No. Okay. All right. Uh, I've actually walked into the wrong class part too, so I don't want to be mad. I, that, that's actually happened before. I walked into the wrong class. Like, oh, this is not my classroom. Uh, these rooms all look like. What, what happens? I went to this room on the fifth floor. Like, I didn't go down the stairs enough, and I've done that at least once in my class. Like, oh, it's not my class. Uh, so it, it happens to everyone. All right. Uh, anything else in the first question? Okay. So let's go on to the rule against perpetuities. Um, before I begin class, direct all of your hate. Your, you know, two minutes of hate, not at me, but the good sir, Mr. Orlando Bridgman, who screwed everything up. Um, the way this doctrine arose is you had these very wealthy families who didn't trust their children, right? You had this very wealthy family, and say you have a father who has all this land, and he's afraid that his oldest born male son is going to screw things up, right? So he says, aha. I'm going to hire this guy, Mr. Bridgman, right, Orlando, to draft a conveyance that cuts out my imbecile son, right, that cuts out my idiot son. And that way, I can make sure that my grandchildren, who I trust, right, can take over the property in due course, right? That way, my son doesn't go sell the estate for, you know, a bottle of whiskey or whatever, right? But the problem arose is what happened? The father didn't have grandchildren yet. He's like, well, you know what? I know my daughter, and I think my daughter will have some really good kids. They're not born yet, but I want to leave it to them. OK, that's fine. What happens if instead of leaving it to your grandchildren, you say, oh, these guys are ingrates. I'm going to roll the dice and say my great-grandchildren. They're going to be the best ones to, to, to manage the estate, right? Well, you don't know the great-grandchildren yet. In fact, you don't know the grandchildren yet. So what the courts start to say is you can't leave an interest for someone who you don't know, right? Who's too far in the future away from you, right? That's the basis of the rule against perpetuities, right? And this is, this is how Texas phrases it. Um, they actually reduce it to a single sentence. I'll read it for you. It says, the rule against perpetuities applies to trusts other than charitable trusts. Period. Okay. Accordingly, an interest is not good 
unless it must vest, if at all, not later than 21 years after some life and being, at the time of the creation of the interest, plus a period of gestation, that means nine months. That is, if a child is in utero, you can actually add nine months because I say, aha, my grandson's not born yet, but my daughter's pregnant, there you go. So you add nine months to it, right? Even if you don't know you're pregnant for the third or the fourth month, you can look back in time and say she was pregnant at this time. He could have known there was a fetus quickening, as they would say. When you do common law, you learn about quickening with Roe v. Wade. I'm ble bleeding my bachelor's words, blending my classes. Uh, God, I get in trouble this way. Okay. So that's how Texas identifies it, okay? Now, before I get to wrap the rule against perpetuities, I need to mention three other rules. Um, the good news is that these have been abolished in all states, almost all states, but at least they've been abolished in Texas. These are the rules of destructibility of contingent remainders. Number one. Number two, the rule in Shelley's case. And number three, it's called the doctrine of worthier title. Okay. Again, Texas abolished all of these by statute. Right? If you don't believe me, I'll show you the code. They're God, they're dead. They've been they've been the rule in Shelley's case, right? See? The common law rule in Shelley's case does not apply in this state. You're welcome, okay? The doctrine of worthier title does not apply. Okay, so but you do need to know them briefly. All right, so the first one, if you go to page 346 in your book, please. 346. It's called the Destructibility of Contingent Remainders. Now, I alluded to this earlier. Someone asked me, I told you, don't ask me why. But I alluded to this earlier. You asked me, Josh, why does it matter if a remainder is vested or contingent? In fact, someone asked me that, right? This is why it mattered. Not anymore, but this is why it mattered. Judges at common law didn't like contingent remainders. Right? Why? Because they were not certain to happen. You would often have to wait and see if, in fact, the condition was satisfied. Right? Also, with a contingent remainder, you could not sell it. Right? If you have a vested remainder, you could sell that. You could inherit it. But with a contingent remainder, it could not be sold because it wasn't certain. Why would you buy something that's, that's a gamble? So the judge developed, the judges developed this doctrine known as the destructibility of contingent remainders. What does that mean? You destroy contingent remainders that don't vest in time. And rather than trying to explain it with words, which always confuses me, let me show you an example. Okay? Okay, so it says. This is example number 25. It says, <clears throat> my voice is almost back. O conveys black acre to A for life, then to B and her heirs if B reaches 21. Now, how do we characterize this? Uh, where am I up to? Oh, yeah, uh, Michelle is next. Uh, uh, M. So, just what's the present interest in this case? Example 25. A has a life interest. What's B? And B has a contingent remainder. Good. Now, and why is it contingent? It's um, contingent upon her. Don't say contingent. Why? What are the two rules for contingent remainders? Don't forget this. Uh, it's not vested. So no. What are the not two? Ascertained. There's not a specific. Number one is this. Well, is B ascertained? And. Um, no, no, no. Is B ascertained in this case? Yes, B is. Okay, what's the second rule, the second condition? Or condition precedent. Is there a condition precedent here? Yes. Okay, what's the condition precedent? Very good. So this is a life estate followed by contingent remainder. Very good, Anne. There's nothing wrong with drafting this conveyance, but what happens when A dies and B is still under the age of 21? That is, A is dead and B has not yet satisfied the condition. Under this rule, you destroy the remainder. And what happens? It goes back to O. It converts into, well, I should say converts, but it transforms into reversion, right? It kills the contingent remainder, 
and it transforms it into your version for O. So basically, if you can imagine just like this, it, when, when A dies and B is not 21, it just strikes out this entire clause. Right? Take a red pen and just strike it out. And then it's just A for life. We know what that means. Reversion for O. Everyone with me on that one. Uh, Shinoda, do you want to take a look at number uh, 26, please? And read it for me, please. Both can make white A to A for life, then B and, and her heirs, if B survives A. Okay. Uh, a has a life of A, B has a contingent remainder, because B is ascertained, but there is a condition subsequent of surviving A. Okay, very good. So now, <laughs> so very good. So now what happens if A conveys his life estate to O? I know what it says, but, but you know, not, if you're very quick in the first part, this, this one's a little tricky. Well, first off, Shinoda, what happens under this, this, this principle, this destructibility of the remainders, right? What happens to B's remainder under this doctrine? If not met at the time of the validating life end, it mm -hmm. gets destroyed. Okay, so here's something funky that happens, right? We know that O might have a reversion at some point in the future. And we know that A is a life estate. What this doctrine basically says is you merge the two, right? You merge the life estate with the, I'm not going to say possibility, but with the chance of reversion, that kills the future remainderment, right? This was one of those crazy doctrines they created. If the, if the life estate person conveys his interest to the grantor, they knock off B. So this doctrine operates in a lot of different ways, right? A could actually knock B out of the chain by giving his life estate back to O. So let's say O made this conveyance, right? And then B really made O mad, right? B did something really bad. And I was like, screw this. I'm going to buy A's life estate and cut out B from the chain of command. So when A dies, it goes back to O. Again, these are not easily reduced to words, but just look at how it operates. This is what's called the merger doctrine. When the present interest is combined with a future interest, it looks a lot like a fee simple, right? With a present interest in life estate and a future interest reversion, when you merge them, the one person has fee simple, O gets a fee simple. I know you don't like it. That's why it was abolished. But you have to look at this was a way where O could cut out the remainder man. O could kill the remainder through this doctrine. You can see why they abolished this. Because it creates a lot of mischief, right? That O can mess up with his Because, you know, B sing their phrase like B's, oh, man, all I have to do is outlive A. And all of a sudden, boom, he's gone, right? He might have been paid for that as well, and he gets cut out real quick. So we get examples number 25 and 26. And if you don't get it, read this paragraph a little bit afterwards. It gives a little bit more explanation, but it's not intuitive. I agree. Again, it's abolished. You'll never see this in the rest of your life, but you have to understand how it works. As bad as rule against perpetuity is, this one's actually a little bit worse. Not really, but it's bad. All right, let's go to the second one. The rule in Shelley's case. Why is it called that? It came from a case called Shelley, right? It's called Shelley's case. And it provides, this one's easy enough to state, that where there's one instrument that creates a life estate in A and it creates a remainder in A's heirs, okay? The remainder becomes a remainder in fee simple. What the hell does that mean? Let me show you. Example 27. O conveys black acre to A for life, then to A's heirs. Wait a minute, Andrew. Why is that so complicated, right? Isn't that always what happens that when A has a fee simple, he has it for his life and decides who gets it upon his death? Isn't that, why, why is that any, any controversial? Why, why is that a bad idea? Um, well, they did, the Germans didn't like it because it didn't allow A to sell or... Ah, oh, there it is. That's the answer, right? If this had simply said to A and his heirs. That means A is a fee simple. 
When you have a fee simple, you can sell it. But here, A only has a life estate. And Andrew, when are A's heirs ascertained? So until A dies, you don't know who's getting it. This was one of these conveyances used to tie up land, like if your son was an imbecile, right? You can tie it up to make sure your son can't sell it. He has it for his life, and when he dies, his heirs get it. But A is basically worthless during his life. He can't sell it. Now, Andrew said correctly, the law courts don't like this very much. Okay? The law courts do not like this very much because it keeps land unsold. So what happens, right, is you basically, you merge them again. You have the life estate. Instead of treating this as a contingent remainder, you treat it as a vested remainder. And they merge. The same person has the life estate and the vested remainder. That equals fee simple. Let's say that again. Under the rule in Shelley's case, you change the contingent remainder to a vested remainder. And then once it's a vested remainder, A has both the life estate and the future interest. They merge into fee simple. Both these first two rules are designed to get you to something approaching a fee simple, that you know where all the present and future interest is, there's nothing lying around. Okay? That means that A can transfer it during his lifetime. Yes, Julian? How is it any different from any other life estate, though? It's not. Okay. Well, it... It, it is because if I say from O to A for life, right, go back to the example we did earlier. From O to A for life, I just had this, right? Mm -hmm. A can't control it after he dies. It goes back to O with reversion. But here, with example 27, A can control it after his life, right? That's the essence of fee simple. You can decide during your life where it goes, or you can sell it. With just A for life, you can sell it, but the sale only lasts as long as your life. That's the life of, say, for Otra V, we did before. Okay, I want to get this one. Again, it's not, it's been abolished. I don't, I don't want to, to dwell on it too long, but you have to understand where we're coming from. Come with me? All right, I think, Julian, you're next. Um, so we get to number 28, right? And this is called the Doctrine <clears throat> of worthier title. And let me just read it to you because I try and summarize, I'll screw it up. Um, where there's an inter vivos conveyance of land, inter vivos means during life, by a grantor to a person, with limitation of the grantor's own heirs, no future interest in the heirs is created. Rather, there's reversion to the grantor. So what do we have here? You want to read that 28, please, Jillian? O conveys black acre to A for life, then to O's heirs. Now, what's weird about that, Jolene? Why? why I haven't really seen before that. It's, it's strange to phrase it like that. Why is that like a weird thing for O to do? Because why would he convey black acre for a life estate if it's... It's strange because of O's heirs rather than someone else's heirs. Very good, very good, very good. Okay. Why would O do this, right? Why would an O just give Blackacre on his own death to his heirs? Why would he hold it with A, with a life estate, in the middle, right? Um, again, this was one of the ways that people tried to tie up land, right? Let's say that O had a son, and he didn't trust his son. He said, okay, I'll tell you what. My son, you know, is 20 or 30 years old. I'm going to wait for him to die, and then I'll give it to my other heirs, right? Because generally, who is an heir of Kamala? The oldest born male son, right? This is a way of getting around it. You say, okay, I'm going to give this to A for his life. And let's say A is only like five years old, right? A is five years old. He's going to outlive my son. And then when my son's dead, it goes to my heirs, that is my grandson. So this was an instrument used to... Um, Leapfrog over, leapfrog over O's oldest born male son. Okay? Everyone get this, right? So, what the doctrine of worthier title said 
is that uh, you, what you basically do is you say there's no remainder at all. Okay? You say that Tay for life, you strike out the contingent remainder. And O is reversion. So you see what happens, right? You basically give it to A's ingrate, I'm sorry, to O's son right away. I said again. O commits black heirs to A for life and to O's heirs. Because this violates the doctrine of worthier title, the courts will just strike out the remainder. They'll strike it out. The red pen in front of the cloud. So what are you left with? From O to A for life. What happens after A dies? Reversion to O. Or O's heirs. So that might be the ingrate son. In other words, you can't keep it away. It might, in fact, go to the ingrate son, or it might not. Yeah. These are bizarre tactics to try and keep land from one person away from another. They didn't always even work. But what this doctrine says is you cross out the interest. Okay. Again, I don't want to kill you on these because all these have been abolished in Texas and most states in the Union. But any questions on the rule of uh, that, I'm sorry, the doctrine of worthier title? Okay. To, to understand these very simply, they're trying to kill contingent remainders, right? <laughs> Find different ways to strike them out and, and to, to make them uh, easier to alienate. Okay, any, any other questions? No? Okay, you ready? No. All right. So now we come on to the uh, the topic that gives law students, you know, palpitations. I don't know why. I mean, it it's something that law students are like. Oh my God, the rule against perpetuities. I remember um, when I was a one L. I I, uh, I was taking a, I think it was a crim law exam. I hadn't taken property yet, and so I was like, Josh, did you say the rule against perpetuities? I'm like, what the hell is that? He goes on a crim law exam. He's trying to mess with me. Uh, but this is something that people remember for years and years and years. Okay, so again, the basic gist of the rule against perpetuities is to make sure that when I leave property to a person, it's not too remote. It's not too far in the future, right? I know my son. I know my grandson. I might know that my great-grandson is in utero, but I'm probably not going to my great-great-great-great-grandson in the future. This rule was designed to prevent interest from vesting too far into the future. And they arrived at a magic number. Let me go back to how the Texas legislature framed it, which I think is a pretty good you know, statement of it. An interest is not good unless it must vest, if at all, not later than 21 years after some life in being at the time of the creation of interest. So it's life and being plus 21 years. Um, one of the oddities, and this came up in the, in the case we assigned, in one case for today, one of the oddities of this doctrine is we presume that people of all ages are fertile. Doesn't matter how old they are, doesn't matter how young they are. There's a famous phrase that will burn your retina called a fertile octogenarian. That's exactly what it sounds like. The fertile octogenarian. We assume even a woman in her 80s can give birth. Uh, men in their 80s can father. That's actually not, not that rare, but we assume that women in their 80s can actually still deliver a child. I, 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 don't, know, I don't know the oldest woman who's ever given birth. I'm just going to Google that for me. Um, but there's a flip side to that one that's actually a little bit troubling called the precocious toddler, which is exactly what it sounds like. That no matter how young a person is, they're also capable of giving birth. And I actually found a story that a five-year-old actually managed to give birth. I, I don't I click the link if you want, but it's bizarre. It's disturbing, really. OK? So that's the basic doctrine, right? It's easy enough to say, but it's a lot harder to apply. And panic. If only this rule were mechanical, right? I can give you the rules for, you know, contingent remainder as executor interest with some certainty. But what makes this one difficult is you have to 
basically prove or disprove a negative, right? You have to show that there's no chance that some future interest can be born, or you have to show it's certain that a future interest will be born. There's always bizarre things where some 80-year-old woman just pops out triplets or something. You know, uh, you know, it, it's possible. Jillian? One week before 67. Is that the age? 67 years old. 66 and... Well, guys, just one, please, one, at, one at a time. Just one, Ashwin, yes? Okay, so we're pushing fertile octogenarian territory. This is fertile septarian, I guess. Sept septenarian. Yeah, Melissa. Five, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's really disturbing. That, that, that the person not only would get pregnant, but someone impregnated. Even that's the bad. Okay. So let's walk through their mechanics, right? And again, this is not mechanical. I don't know why they call it. I wish they didn't use this phrase, but they call it mechanics. The first question you have to ask yourself is, does the rule against perpetuities actually apply? <coughs> okay? And the rule against perpetuities only applies to interests that are not vested, right? If you have a vested remainder, you're good. You don't have to worry about the rule against perpetuities. Now, we have other types of interests, you do have to worry about them. You have contingent remainders, and you have executory interests. Okay? The book discusses class gifts. Don't worry about that. It makes it even worse. But if you have a contingent remainder or an executory interest, you need to apply the rule. This is why I don't ask them on the exam, right? Because every time I give you an exam question and there's a contingent remainder, you are obligated to go against the rule. You're obligated to consider the rule against perpetuities, right? Every time you have an executory interest, you need to go through RAP. It messes things up. So, but you have to know for the future. If your interest is vested, you're good. If your interest is contingent or executory, you got to walk down this deep, scary rabbit hole. Okay. The second step, and it's not really a step. But the second step described is, will the interest might not vest within this period? That is, with life and being plus 21 years. The purpose of RAP is to strike down things that happen too far in the future. So you need to determine, will this interest vest in this period, right? Will everything wrap up in this period? Okay. You have to be certain right, that a contingent interest will in fact vest, that is terminate, no later than 21 years after the death of some person alive at the creation of the interest. Let me set up here again, this, this is a mouthful, okay? You must prove that a contingent interest is certain to vest or terminate no later than 21 years after the death of some person who is alive at the time of the creation of the interest. You have to be certain, 100%. If you are not certain, the interest is void from the outset. Right? If you can't prove that statement I read to you with certainty, the interest is void from the outset, it takes no effect. You strike out the remainder altogether. You kill the remainder. Okay? I'm going to give you one more rule and then we'll do examples. I promise you this will be a lot easier with the examples. We'll do example 29 in a minute. Okay? You need to find what's called a validating life. Okay? A validating life. This is a very important step. Someone has to be alive now to show you that the future interest will vest or fail to vest. 21 years after that person dies. Okay? This is your person that you're counting 21 years from after their death. That's your validating life. Okay? If you find such a person and you're certain it will vest, then, you're, then your remainder is fine. But if no such person exists, then the interest will be void unless it can vest within 21 years. 
I know, I just told you it makes no sense. I, I know. Let's see the examples. It'll get a little bit easier. Um, okay. Miranda, do you want to read number 29 for me, please? Okay, stop right there. Okay. Notice this isn't only about real property. It also refers to trust of money. But, but it, the, the concept's very similar. Okay. O transfers a sum in trust A for life. Okay, that's a life estate. Then to A's first child to reach 21. So Miranda, what do we, what's the future interest here? What would we call that? Okay, and with step one, when you have a contingent remainder, does wrap apply? Yes. Okay, so we know rule against perpetuity applies with a contingent remainder. Okay, so the next step we have to find is, is there a validating life? Okay, is there a validating life? Okay, in this case, there is. Why is A the validating life? A is already in existence. This person is ascertained, so you know this person exists. But you can prove, right? And this is going to be tricky. You can prove with 100% certainty that any child of A who reaches 21 will necessarily reach 21 within 21 years of A's death. That's a mouthful. Let me say it to you differently. Okay? If I have a child, right, today, and I die tomorrow, Right? I have a child today and I die tomorrow. There is no doubt that within 21 years of my death, he will celebrate his 21st birthday. Right? On his 21st birthday plus one day, he'll celebrate my death, maybe. I don't know, right? But if I have a child today, 100%, 100% certainty that child will reach 21 within 21 years of my life. Okay? The remainder must vest or fail from that period. It can't possibly take more than 21 years for the child to turn 21 after my death, right? It either will happen or it won't, right? I might die, I'm sorry, my child might die the day after I die. It didn't vest. But it will have to vest if at all. Now I'll get you a second, Julian. Let's do example 30. Jordan, read number 30, please. Okay, stop right there. Jordan, is there any way that this condition can be satisfied? With it, I mean, let me finish the sentence. You're, you're right. But is there any way that this condition can be satisfied within 21 years of A's death? No. Why not? Because they don't have a child. Right. It's impossible, right? Well, not possible. It's very likely that within 21 years after A's death, there will not be a 25-year-old child, right? It's possible that maybe A lives for another 100 years and has all these kids that reach 25. But you can prove there's a circumstance where it will not happen within 21 years after A's death. Therefore, the remainder is voided under the rule against perpetuities, <coughs> right? The remainder is void under the rule against perpetuities. So you strike the contingent remainder. A is life estate. O has, Jordan? Bingo. O is your version. Very good. Let me say it again. Because there is a possibility that this condition will not invest within 21 years of A's death, the interest is void and under wrap. You strike it out, you take this entire clause out, and you're stuck with A for life. O is your version. Done. Jillian, I was patiently waiting. I'm good. It's, uh, I was just wondering what happened if the child died. That's exactly right. Because the child could die, <coughs> but that's actually not the issue. The, the first one, the child could die also, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not about what actually happens. It is could it happen, right? Could a child who's born today turn 21 in 21 years? Yes. That's all you need to know. It's will it vest or will it not? Everything must happen in that 21-year window. If the events transpire outside the 21-year window, right, then it's no longer permissible under wrap.
I have one with me. All right. Let's try number 31. Well, this is, again, I think this is a lot, um, is a lot easier given examples and trying to explain the rules. Uh, Megan, you want to read for number 21, please? Uh, I'm sorry, 31? Please divide this property so my grandchildren can reach 21. Okay, keep going. T leaves two children and three grandchildren under 21. Okay, stop right there. Thank you. Okay, so again, this is property, not a trust, but it really doesn't make much of a difference. It's, it's, the difference is not, not important for you. Okay. T devises property to my grandchildren to reach 21. T has two children and three grandchildren under 21. Now, here comes the hard part, right, Megan? What interest do the grandchildren have? What would we describe? What's the present interest here? Well, it says T devises property to my grandchildren reach 21, right? T dies, okay? This isn't a will, right? The grandchildren have a contingent remainder, you're right, okay? What's the remainder contingent on? What's the condition? Okay. At the time of T's death, how old are his grandkids? At the time of T's death, how old are the grandchildren? Very good. Okay. Now, Megan. Is it certain that any of the three kids will ever reach 21? Is it certain that any of us wake up tomorrow? No. No. I won't be morbid here, but it's true, right? Even, let's say all those grandkids are 20 years old, or triplets, right? They'll call the birthday coming up. They could all die. Right? It's true. It happens. So, Megan, who then do we use to validate? Who's our validating life here? Yes. T's children. Right? Now, why? Megan, I'll stop with the last question for you. Why are T's children, the parents, our validating lives? They can have more kids. Yes, exactly right. Because T's children can have more kids. And let's say the triplets die, a horrible car wreck, right? The triplets are gone. T can have more children. It's not just T's children. It's whichever one of T's children lives longer. Okay? Whichever one of T's children lives longer. The validating life is actually the survivor of T's two children. Because you know, you know, that when both parents are dead, without any doubt, the child will have 21 within 21 years, right? That once the parent dies, you have a 21-year clock. And it's certain that either a child will reach 21 or will not reach 21 in that time frame. Are you laughing at Rachel? That's okay. Let me tell you a story. When my very first day of teaching, <laughs> it's on YouTube, you can watch it. My very first day of teaching, I, you want to raise your little sippy cups, right? I had an analogy about my first day, and I had unscrewed it, and um, I literally knocked it over all over the place. My very first minute of teaching, it's on YouTube, you can watch it. Um, <laughs> And then as I was trying to futz with the, the, the thing cleaned up, I knocked my laptop over. <laughs> I remember the laptop came first in the water. I forget which was which. It was, it was bad. But so it's okay to laugh. It's fine. This is why I don't use analogy. Those things are stiff. This, if I knock this over, it just was a little trick, trickle this way. That's why I don't use analogy. That was, that was really bad. Never use a bubble ever again. It was, you know, the, the, the wide mouth ones? Yeah, that's a bad idea. Bad, bad, bad. All right. So any questions on example number 31? Uh, yeah, Mariah. If multiple children reach 21, do they, do they go to the first child that reaches 21, or do they split the class? Um, as, <clears throat> as each child enters the class, I think they have to divvy it up. So um, it becomes problematic if there's money, because the first one might spend it, right? 
but here it's only a contingent remainder. You so it's it's basically once a, once one child reaches twenty one, that becomes vested for him, but subject to open. Remember that phrase, vested remainder subject to open. Then other children can enter in the class. So you can imagine the oldest one turns to one is like, yay, party, and sells all the land. And it's like, well, where's my property, right? So I think there are certain limitations on that as well. But I don't want to go too far into that. So the next case. Um, this is, oh, I'm sorry, but Jordan, yes. Um, I just wanted to clarify on that. So you need to prove that either the interest will vest or terminate. Yes, either one. Either one. That is, all the kids will die or all the kids will survive. Okay. Either one. It's very morbid. You have to anticipate like all these five-year-olds having babies and these people suddenly dying on their 21st birthday. You have to like put these things in your mind. It's a bizarre thing. Okay. It with me so far. Okay. All right, let's go on. And let's do the case. It's a short case, very, very, very famous case. It wasn't in the other, the sixth or the seventh editions. They added here. I'm actually glad they did. Or maybe I'm not. I don't know. But it's an easy enough case, I think. At least. Uh, Celeste, do you want to give me the facts, please, in G versus Audley? What a good name. Um, so Audley, uh, his life is safe in his wife. And the terms are that once the wife dies, it goes to the niece, Mary, and had issues. And if Mary dies with no issues, then it's divided to the other living daughters of John and Elizabeth Jane. Okay. Um, Audley died, and his wife had died also. Um, and Mary, ha Mary Howe had no issues, and then the G's were living and was 70 years old, and the four daughters of the G's brought suit to have the, I guess, was that a trust or the estate, the 1,000, is it euros? Uh, pounds. Pounds, thank you. Uh, secured for the benefit, should Mary Hall die without issue, the court um, considered the question and requested the daughter, the daughters and living of the G's was not void. Was void, sorry. Okay. All right, very good, everyone with me, okay? Let's walk through this um, conveyance, this will, one line at a time. The, the, the wording is a little bit maybe foreign, so I hope I can explain it a little bit better. Also, my will is that 1,000 pounds, because fellow symbol means pounds, shall be placed out at interest during my life, during the life of my wife, which interest I give her during her life. And stop right there. The wife has Rebecca. What, what kind of estate? Uh, life estate. Okay, very good. So he left his wife a thousand dollars with interest um, during her life. And at her death, it is at her wife's death. I give the said one thousand dollars unto my niece. Now wait a minute. What if the wife spends everything? Right. Basically, the wife is living off the interest. Right, that, 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 that's I think what they're getting at, right? It's like she can't touch the principal. This is about the interest of the, uh, 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 the interest of the, of the bank account. Thousands of pounds was a lot of money back then. Okay, so then after her death, I give it to my niece. So then uh, Rebecca, take it off. What interest does uh, Mary Hale have? What do you call the interest after a life estate here. Uh, vested or How do you know it's vested? Uh, because the property is ascertained and there's no condition Very good. So I think she's right that Mary Hale, the niece, has a vested remainder. But then we get a comma. Okay, it says, unto my niece, Mary Hale, and the issue of her body lawfully begotten. What the hell is that? That means children. That means if Mary Hale has children. It doesn't say Mary and her heirs. Just pay, pay attention. It's not fee simple, right? So it's not a vested remainder in fee simple. It's not. And to be begotten. Begotten means to give birth. And in default of such issue, Mike, what the heck does that mean, in default of such issue? If that fails. If what, what's that? Uh, if she does not have children. That's right. So she, in default of such issue, that means if she dies without kids, right? If she dies without children, I give the thousand dollars to be not the interest, but the actual principal, to be equally divided between the daughters then living of John and Elizabeth G. So 
What then, Mike, is the interest for the daughters of John Elizabeth G? How we describe it? We said that the best remainder in Mary, the niece. What do the grandkids or the daughters have? Well, remember the pairings, right? Where the first interest is the best remainder. What's an executory interest? Bingo. The, the daughters have a shifting executory interest. Everyone see that? The daughters have a shifting executory interest. Why? The daughters are cutting short Mary Hale's interest, right? If Mary has kids, they get it. It's theirs. They get the money. But if they do not have kids, Elizabeth G. cuts short any interest, right? So we have here vested remainder. And uh, Mariah, is vested remainder subject to raft? Yes. Okay. A vested remainder, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. You answered the question correctly, I asked the wrong thing, right? Is an executory interest subject to rule against perpetuities? Yeah. Okay, she, she knew what I meant, too. The executory interest is subject to raft, okay? <coughs> G's, the daughter G's, executory interest subject to wrap. Okay, so Mariah, what does the court do here? Is this interest valid? Um. This, is, this is the magic question, right? It's subject to wrap. Is this valid? The court found that the interest to the pendants was revoked. Okay, so Mariah, actually, Audrey, let me ask this question, please. Who is here the validating life? Um, Who? The... Go back to the question we asked a minute ago, the example 31, right? Who is the validating life in this question, example 31? Uh, right. Why, why were G's, uh, T's children the validating life here? So Audrey, come back here. Who's our validating life here? Um, Who's our validating life here in, the, in this will? Say so you said it. The parents, and why are the parents validating life here? Because they can pop out more daughters, <laughs> right? Here we have language that's very precise. The daughters then living, Max, right? This phrase, the daughters then living. Living when? when what time frame is that referring to? Living when? Um, at their death. At whose death? The G's. No. Oh, at, at uh, Mary Hale's. Yes. So it's asking, when Mary Hale dies, who are the daughters living? Right now, we know that there are what two daughters here. The facts say there could be more daughters, right? What if you know Mary Hale lives to be ninety years old, and then Elizabeth G lives to be one hundred and twenty, and she's popping babies out, popping daughters one after the other, right? Is it certain that a daughter will be in existence? Within 21 years of the of the life of Elizabeth and, and, and uh, uh, John G, the court says it's too remote, right? It's too remote that this may vest more than 21 years after the validating lives of John Elizabeth G. Okay. The key point here, right? The key point here is it says daughters now living. Right? I'm sorry, daughters uh, then living. It's referring to people not yet born. And those people may be born more than tw 21 years too late. Okay? Now, what if I said like this, right? The book gives a different phrasing. Let me type this one out. Okay? If the gift <coughs> over had been. Uh, to the daughters now living who are then living, it would have been good. Okay, the book is, this is actually page 335, note number three. Okay? Uh, 
Casey, let me ask you this one, right? What if the conveyance had this, right? It refers to the gifts of the daughters now living. Okay? That is the daughters alive at the time of the conveyance, who are still living. Is there any problem with that? Why would that be different than what we have in, in our case? Well, because these, um, it would be a vested interest, wouldn't it? Well, would it make it vested? But if a daughter is living now, oh, no. yeah. if a daughter is living now and living then, why is that good or very good? Because it, it does, then you don't have to worry about the parents having a job. Yes, right? right. If he would have limited it, right, and go back to the mm -hmm. language. If he would have limited it to the daughters in existence now, then for certain, Edward would have known about them. And he could have used himself as a validating life, right? Because he knows about these people. Or he could have used Mary Hale, because these people were alive at the time of Mary Hale's life. But because it says the daughters then living, at some point in the future where Mary Hale dies, and then, if the parents have a child many years after Mary Hale dies, it's too remote. Right? Again, it says the daughters, plural. So you have to wait for every single daughter to pop out of Elizabeth and, and, and John, right? As long as John and Elizabeth are alive, they're capable of making more children. And because they're capable of making more children, that class can keep growing, growing, growing after Mary Hale dies. Let's say Mary Hale dies in the year 1800. Make it easy, right? In the year 1830, another daughter is born. That interest will not possibly vest within 21 years after Mary Hale's death. That is the important point. Everyone get that, right? The key point here is that after Mary Hale dies, John and Elizabeth can keep having daughters one after the other more than 21 years after Mary Hale's death. And because that's a possibility, the interest is void. And what happens, uh, Hannah? What happens after we strike the contingent remainder? Who gets to keep the money? Yeah, who gets to keep the money? Well, again, we said that the wife had a life estate. She was dead, right? What interest did Mary Hale have? What, what did we say she had? No, no, no. Mary Hale. What interest did Mary Hale have? She said, I think Rebecca said it a minute ago. Very good. So it's a best remainder subject to? Very good. So under the rule against perpetuities, what do we do to the executory interest? Strike it. So now what interest does Mary Hell have? A vest remainder in? Very good. Everyone see that, right? With the rule against perpetuities, where the future interest is void, where the executor interest is void, the courts strike it out. What's left? Mary Hell. The childless woman, right? She gets a vest remainder in fee simple, and she can sell that or spend it do whatever she wants with it. That's the key point here, right? So here, who is arguing what? Mary Hale is saying, rule against perpetuity, screw the, you know, screw, kill this executory interest. And the daughters, G, were like, no, 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 we got this, we got this, we're here, we're here. And the court said, nope, you're too vested. Now think about it. If you're Edward Audley, do you think he intended this to happen? Of course not, right? He says, look, the Elizabeth and John G are old, they're not having more kids. I know who their daughters are. I don't have to name them, right? I just know that if my cousin or my niece Mary doesn't have any kids, I'll give it to these other daughters. But the court says, we're not going to follow the intention of the parties. These rules are old and settled, and it's not my job to fix up sloppy drafting, right? Audley could have easily done this and given this conveyance, and it would have been fine. But he, the way he did it was, was improper. All right, so questions on the G case? 
Um, as it turns out, the, the facts were all over the place, that there actually were, were three daughters, uh, not four. There were also sons involved. Uh, but Elizabeth, she was past childbearing age. And Mary Hale did die without having any more children. But because of the rule against perpetuities, Mary Hale had this vest remainder, and it was hers to do whatever she wanted. Andrew? Yeah, so my question is in your alternate um, yeah. script. Yeah, this, I didn't make this up. This is from the book. It's on page 335, yeah. note 3. Um, if you use the language... They're not, they don't count. They don't get anything. Yeah, the class is closed, right? Okay. In other words, there were, what, were three daughters alive at the time? I mean, you can even say, you know, for really, you know, Sally, you know, you know, Sal, I don't know Sam and uh, Sarah, whatever. I make it, I'm bad at making up names. But, you know, they just named them. It, it's the exact same thing. It's only these three daughters, a class can't open anymore. Make sense? Okay. Everyone with me in this case. All right. Let's do um let's do some examples and uh maybe make this make a little bit more clarity. Go to page 358, please. There are a lot of examples here. I'll go through a couple of them here. Um uh, Christiana, do you want to read for me number 1, please? On page 358. Okay, so we start off, Christiana. What are the present and future interests here? This is a review. Very good. What, what kind of what kind of interest does B have? What do we call that? Very good. Okay, so we say B has contingent remainder. Therefore, Christiana, does wrap apply? Yes. Okay, so we know wrap applies. Okay, so second, who's our validating life for B's remainder? A. Okay, you said A. Why do you say A? Um, Why well, can't B be his own validating life? <laughs> ah, so in this case, actually, the validating life is B. B is alive, right? Now, Christiana, this is an easy question. Is it certain that B will reach the age of 30 within 21 years of B's death? <laughs> yes, it's a trick question. No, no, say it again. Will B reach the age of 30 within 21 years of B's death? Will the condition settle? In other words, is it, okay, let me ask this differently. Okay. Christiana, is it possible for B to reach the age of 21 after B's death? You mean A's death? No, I mean B. Well, if B dies, it depends when B dies. If B dies before 21, you can't reach 21. And, no, this, is, this question is very, it's deliberately tricky. Can B age after B dies? No, you can't. Okay. So is the condition certain to vest or terminate within 21 years after B's death? I see nodding now. Yeah, Anthony, I take a step? Anyone want to take a step? Anyone see what I'm getting at here? It's a very tricky question. Julian? Maybe you can explain better than I can. Okay, so he, <laughs> if he dies at if he dies at two, yeah. he can never reach twenty one in twenty one years. That's right. If he dies at twenty two, he's already reached twenty one in twenty one years. So ah. it depends on what these So let, let me try this again. With rap you ask two questions. Will the interest vest or terminate within twenty one years of B's death? There is a one hundred percent chance that B will either reach 21 or not reach 21 within 21 years of his death. Right? It's a trick question because B is the validating life. Right? It's not A, it's B. We know for certain that within 20... So let's say B dies at the age of 50. Right? 
he will either have reached 21 or not, right? He reached it. Let's say he died at the age of three. He didn't reach it. But you know this will happen within 21 years of B's death. Therefore, it's certain to vest or not vest within 20, 20 years of B's death. So it's valid under wrap. Christiana, do you see now the issue? Don't lie. No, if you, if you don't get it, tell me. Anthony, do you see the issue? No, no. If you, no, I do get it. I, I, mean, I, I, I see where it's, it's a trick. They ask this question very deliberately because they want to trick you up. The answer is yes. It has to be. When you are your own validating life, let me try it like this, right? When you are your own validating life, you're good. Because you are alive, you're in control of your own destiny. You're either going to die or you're not. There's no voiding it. So B's contingent remainder in this case is fine under the rule against perpetuities. And don't be thrown off at the age of 30. That's what they want to trick you. You say, oh crap, 30 is more than 21, right? That's what a lot of you are probably thinking. No. 21 is a magic number of your own death. Julian. B is the validating life because it says to be with a comma. Right? Well, then identifying who the validating life is tricky, right? But you try to pick the validating life that will create the most possible damage, most complications, right? This one covers the most possible scenarios by putting B. Picking A is not enough, right? Because B is in being at the time. You want to pick the, I don't want to say the youngest person, but generally you try and go towards the younger person at the time who's alive at this moment. Because he's alive at this moment, that makes him invalidating life. So basically yes. he is the controller of his destiny. destiny. Yeah. Let's try number two. Um, you want you want to try it, uh, uh, Elena? Please, please read it. Okay. Okay. So again, it says, "O of A for life." That I don't want to I'll get to the I promise. O of A A for life, and A's children for their lives. Now again, why wouldn't he just say from O to A and his heirs? He doesn't trust A, right? Would well, that be a lot easier? Give A if he's simple. We didn't do that. It says O to A for life, then to A's children for their lives, then to B if B isn't alive, and if B is not then alive, to B's heirs. So first we have to classify. So what are our present and future interests, Elena? Very good. Well, are, are the children ascertained? What kind of remainder do we have here for the age children? Why? What are our two rules to determine if it's vested or contingent remainder? Read the sentence. It tells you. Resume what? Okay. So what kind of remainder do we have for his children? Louder. Okay, very good. So A's children have a contingent remainder. And what comes after that? Okay, and what, what, what interest does B have? No. No, Chelsea, you want to take a step? Very good. Remember the pairings, right? Where the first one's contingent, the second will be contingent also. Right? So A's children have a contingent remainder, and then B has a contingent remainder, and then Chelsea, what about the weird one? What about B's heirs? What do they have? Uh, it's not executor. It's a pairing. The first two are contingent. What's the third one? You have three contingent remainders stacked. Crazy, right? But that's not the hard part, right? That's the easy part. We know there are contingent remainders. They're not ascertained. Okay? Elise, who's our validating life here? Who do you think it is? Well, who are our options, right? What are our options for validating lives?
Well, life is a person is not a good person because they're going to die. So who do you think the validating life is going to be? I think it's B. I think it's right. Right? And we know that B is ascertained. B has a name. Might as well call him Bob, right? But B is ascertained. B is alive. Okay? Now, we know that the remainder to A's children is contingent. Right? Because at the time this conveyance, A has no children. Uh, but, uh, Rochelle? Rochelle. Oh, so close. Rochelle. Rochelle. Um... What happens if children are, in fact, born during A's life? What happens there? Yeah. Is that interest valid? You know, let me ask you a question differently. Can A possibly have children after A's death? Actually, you count in vitro. It's complicated, thing. But, but again, unless they put in vitro in the exam, there's no in vitro, okay? But without in vitro fertilization, can A have children after she dies? Okay, that's right, Rochelle. So, is children valid under wrap? Which one is it? You gave one of those answers is correct. <laughs> I'll tell you which one, though. I can say yes. No, which one? Again, why in this case? Well, we already said that B is the measuring life, right? Is it certain that children of A will be born within 21 years of B's death? What's the what's the rub here, right? When must A's children be born? Twenty-one years before B dies. Well, but how can Zombie A give birth? No. So when must A's kids be born? Okay, very good. That's right. So we say, right, that the remainder to A's children is valid, right? It must vest or fall at A's death. It must. If A's children are alive after A, they get it. If they die before, the remainder fails. But you know for certain that at A's death, the children will be ascertained or not. Okay? Everyone get that? Let's do one more, then I'll let you guys out a little bit for spring break, okay? Brooke, let's go to the last one, okay? Oh, you, oh, you were almost gone. <laughs> so close. Let's talk about B's heirs. Okay, let's talk about B's heirs. Okay. Is the gift to B's heirs valid or not? I'm going to say no. Okay, why do you say no? Um, because I think there's a possibility of it not vesting. What happens, Brooke, if B dies after A's children? Right? So A's children are alive, and then B dies later. What happens to the property? That the kids are still alive, that A's children are still alive, and then B dies. What happens in that case? Where does it go upon on the children's death? Okay, very good. So is that, is, that, is that okay? Any problem with that? Is that a valid conveyance? So I guess if B is dead, he doesn't have heirs. So Within how many years? Within years? There it is, right? So you know that when B dies, he'll have heirs immediately. And the property then goes to B's heirs. Now, Brooke, I'll just finish you off, right? If B dies before A's children, right? Then what? Right? B dies first. Right? B dies before A's children. I'm sorry, B dies, I'm sorry, after A's children is the wrong thing. Yeah, I just asked, I'm sorry. If B dies after A's children, 
Then what happens? Who gets it? If B dies after A's children, who gets it? No, not B's heirs. If A's children are dead and B's still alive, what happens? So will the interest vest? Yeah. Okay. So it's certain that the interest will either vest in B or fail in B. Therefore, it's valid. And this conveyance works under the rule against perpetuities. You're welcome for not testing on this. <laughs> Any other questions? Have a good spring break. I'll see you on Tuesday. Next.